Good afternoon. Thanks very much. Good to be here. I'm trying to convey insights from 25 years of research into system innovation and transitions in 25 minutes. So that's quite a challenge. Um, but I'll start off with the miracle of Paris. Because I really think in terms of system innovations, this is a kind of an historical landmark. And let me explain briefly why. Not only because of the words, not only because of the symbols, but it follows more or less a kind of an evolutionary planning strategy. And that is very much what we are standing for. If you want to govern a complex transition process, the best possible way that we have found is to do it in an evolutionary manner. So that means that you formulate a long-term revolutionary goal, phasing out fossil fuels by 2050, and then taking incremental evolutionary steps to that goal. And that is actually what has happened, and that is why I liked it, because what you will see is, based on this symbol, the world will fall apart between, let's say, the old and the new economy. I do not even use the words green anymore or green growth. You simply have the old economy and the new one. And after the Paris Accord, it's up to you whether you want to be part of the old economy or the new economy. What is striking to me that I really um, was approached the past couple of weeks by many, many journalists from many, many media all over Europe. But the past couple of days, I haven't heard any signal from the old economy. Not a single signal. Where was Shell? Where was BP? Where was ExxonMobil? Not a single world. So it's up to us. You want to be part of the old linear centralized economy or the new circular bio-based one. It's up to you. It will definitely lead to a fossil fuel breakdown because at the financial markets from now on, fossil fuels will be associated with a major financial risk. And of course, that touches upon, let's say, the global divestment movement that started at universities and was ignored for quite some time, but it's taken more seriously now. And of course, the whole issue of stranded fossil fuel assets will become more and more important. But no way, ladies and gentlemen, this transition will be easy or, let's say, will have a smooth course. No way. I started 30 years ago my career and I was engaged in the first three COPs. I even worked at the United Nations that far. And what I've heard so far also this afternoon is that many people perceive transitions as a kind of a battle between technologies. And that is way too simple. Of course, technologies are important, but transitions are really shifts in power. It's about shifts in institutions in regulation, in social structures, in soft innovation. So it's not only, and that was also my comment on the first keynote speaker, if it would be so simple that it was, let's say, a kind of a race bottom to, let's say, the winning technology, then we would have gotten much further in the past 30 years. I'm sorry to say, but this is simply a kind of a macroeconomic bias. A transition is way more complicated. A transition is about fundamental shifts in the way we think, let's say our predominant paradigm, the way we organize ourselves in the basic structures, both physical infrastructures, economic, social infrastructures, but also in our daily practices. And of course, these are nested. It's very difficult to separate them. But can you imagine how difficult it is to accomplish a fundamental shift in how we think, in how we organize, and how we do our daily practice? 
And, and even more complicated is that it is really a shift in power. There are certain groups that has the power, the incumbents, and there are emerging groups that want to get that power. And in each and every transition that we have studied so far in the past 200 years, you see that shift in power, and there are various patterns underlying that, um, because the, the regime protects itself against the upcoming emerging power in the most subtle and smart ways, and that's what we will see again in the coming years. There's no way that the fossil fuel industry will simply accept the Paris Accord and go with the flow of the new economy. No. I started as a trained mathematician, and in a highly stylized, simplified way, a transition that is successful can be represented as in, in terms of an S-shaped curve. In practice, it's much more whimsical, it's a much more shock-wise development, but at least you can learn from it. It's a non-linear evolvement, and it goes in phases. And the non-linearity indicates that there are different phases. There are relatively long periods of dynamic equilibria and relatively short phases of chaos, instability. And my statement of today is that we are in this phase of chaos. We are in between two worlds, the old and new economy, the old and new energy supply system. So in my interpretation, we have reached, in terms of global energy supply and demand, the tipping point. I cannot prove it yet, but I have a couple of strong and weak signals brought with me, and I would like to share some of these signals with you. First of all, chaos, and I think we need to celebrate chaos. I'm a complexity thinker, and what you can learn from chaos is that it says on the one hand that the old systems and structures are not working anymore and the new ones are emerging and need to prove themselves. So if you want to organize or influence systemic change, you need a lot of chaos. And I think that the next couple of years will be given much more chaos than now. Secondly, conflict. Thirdly, it will turn into a battlefield. I will give you some example of each of the three. Let's have a look here at the chaos and turbulence. One year ago, we were, let's say, uh, still stuck with a very high oil price. It's now extremely low. 30, 40, 50 dollars per barrel, extremely low. Was it predicted that way? Not by many people. Two years ago, we passed the tipping point that for the first time in human history, the newly installed capacity of renewables was more than the fossil fuel newly installed capacity. So I brought that with me, this is this figure. That is really an indication of a tipping point. That means that it's not the question whether fossil fuels will be phased out, but how long will it take? Let me go backwards. Three years ago, many of us proclaimed that there was a shale gas revolution. By now, what we have seen the past couple of months is that many of these investors are struggling financially. They are even withdrawing themselves from the so-called shale gas revolution. Four years ago we had Fukushima. After that nuclear energy turned into a nuclear path work. Even more chaos. Trying to determine some tipping point indicators. Coal fire plants are phased out worldwide. You see it all over. There's for the first time a decoupling between economic growth and carbon dioxide emissions. All the big European energy companies are suffering um, the price of solar was already mentioned, dropped by 80%. And in many, many regions, we are already reaching the grid parity. Um, that is unique. That's a unique signal. If I look at the second part, conflicts, there are more and more conflicts emerging between continents on resources, on energy. 
Um, if, if we look at the Ukraine increases, it's basically, of course, on natural gas. If we look at the ongoing conflict between China and Europe, we see the same between the America and China, between Germany and the energy vendor and other European countries. It's actually a sign of the time. Look at this response from one of the biggest energy companies in the world. Gerard Mestralet, the CEO, he said literally the speed by which we are building in Europe wind farms and solar panels, it needs to be delayed. The situation is untenable because it kills our business. If you are arguing still like this, and he did it a couple of months ago, you will be out of business in five or ten years. There's no doubt about it. It turns into a global energy battlefield. Look at the market value of one of the biggest energy companies in Europe, RWE. It has decreased by 85% over the last seven years. I was in a meeting in Stockholm last year with the three big energy companies, RWE, Vattenfalls, and E.ON. And my statement was three out of five of energy companies will die out in the next 10 years. They approached me afterwards and they say, Jan, that's a great story. Of course, we are not part of those three out of five companies that will die out. I say, really? Do you really think that? Of course, we are prepared. I don't think so. I don't think so. Do they have an alternative business model? No. And this is the evolutionary part of the revolution. It's not the biggest companies that will survive. It's not even the smartest one, but the most adaptive ones, the most agile ones. Are they flexible enough to withstand this storm? I don't think so. So if you look at the way in which we can govern in these complex processes, is it possible anyhow to govern it? Well, yes and no. You cannot govern this complexity in terms of command and control. It's way too uncertain. It's way too complex. But you can influence in a more subtle way the direction and the speed of it. And that is what I call an evolutionary form of governance or planning. So there are some underlying theoretical principles. Perhaps it goes too far for some of you, but there's a whole lot of literature on this. Uh, based on complexity science, we took three of the most determining factors, emergence, co-evolution, and self-organization. And around that, we formulated steering principles for influencing these long-term transitions. And actually, it comes down to, in practice, that you create spaces for radical innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very good at incremental innovation. So we are very good at doing things more efficiently and more smartly, but are we really good at doing things entirely different? No, not always. And this is the key in transition processes, doing things entirely different, bring together front runners in what we call transition arenas, protected innovation spaces, trying to develop a long-term goal that's actually what also happened in Paris here, and trying to take incremental steps every couple of years onto these goals. And trying to experiment. This is all about searching, learning, and experimenting. So based on policy request, we burn that down till a cycle, a kind of a transition governance cycle, in which we distinguish four different steps, bring together front runners dealing with radical innovation, trying to formulate a long-term vision, different pathways. This is not about blueprint thinking. This is not about creating the ultimate solution. This is about searching, learning, and experimenting, and trying to learn in a social context from it, and trying to scale it up if there are successful experiments among this. Actually, you are pleading for a different kind of arena. We need the market arena. We need the political arena, but both have different currencies. Both are not dealing enough with radical innovation. So you need a kind of different arena that takes account of that different form of innovation. Not incremental only, but radical, revolutionary, long-term problem and goal searching. 
So I call that transition governance and more and more colleagues with me. So on the one hand, it's challenging the market and mobilizing society. And on the other hand, it's long-term thinking and short-term action. It's NN. Don't fall into the trap that you create antagonism between or, or. It's NN, and long-term and short-term. It's and revolutionary and evolutionary. It's a kind of organic steering. Vision, action, strategy in one. But it demands patience, time, and trust. That also holds for the Paris Agreement. Patience, time, and trust. About 10 years ago, we have formulated these principles in terms of a policy. And we have been experimenting in various countries, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. And as often, you learn most from your failures. What does it mean in terms of regular policy? It means a more facilitating role of the state, creating spaces for those radical innovation processes, removing barriers, very important. There are many, many barriers on our way to a carbon low-carbon society, organizational, institutional, juridical, mental barriers, and stimulating enough of the financial innovations. So in the first phase, it's more about experimenting, learning from it. In the second phase, it's more about scaling it up based on the selection process. I cannot go into the details, but there's a way of literature around here. And the most difficult part is how to implement it in an integral way in the policy process. I'll round off with some applications to make it more tangible uh, to you. We have been practicing this in many European countries, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France, in Scotland, Switzerland, Austria, Finland, but also outside Europe. There's some experience in Japan and Australia and Canada. And we have been doing this work in many European cities all over the place. Um, if you look at the application domains, it's not only focused on energy, but also on mobility, food, healthcare, and the whole pattern is shifting now from the more hard sectors like energy and transport to healthcare and education, the more softer domains. Um, if you look at the lessons that we've learned, a couple of points here to take out. Um, we have achieved good results with the first phase, searching, learning, and experimenting. But so far, there's a lack of, let's say, results focusing on scaling up and trying to get broader support. Normally, you start off these processes with small groups of front runners, and you try to, let's say, create a bigger and broader support. That is more difficult than in the beginning phase. Uh, we have a lack of full implementation results, let's say, within governance, within ministries. And there are major differences across countries. Even in Belgium, it's quite different from the Netherlands. In Germany, it's different from Belgium. Um, if you look at how we started in the Netherlands about 15 years ago, we created the Dutch energy transition. So analytically, we have followed the path of developing a long-term vision for sustainable energy in 2050 trying to define seven different themes. You see them here on the screen, even coming up with 23 different transition pathways and doing more than 250 transition experiments. But look at what has been created around it. Organizational structures that uh, crept into the regime and that fell back into a kind of command and control form of steering. So what you see is that the whole institutional palette makes it way too complicated. So on the one hand, it was a success, but on the other hand, a failure, because the success was that there was a lot of more attention for long-term energy thinking. There was a lot of more money invested, a lot of more experiments. There were thousands of people in the Netherlands involved. There was a new discourse. There was a new agenda of reform. But what you saw was that the big guys of the regime said, okay, this is part of our process. And an energy transition is okay, but not too radical, not too fast. We need more time. So the whole process became too much institutionalized and too political, too centralized. There was also an overly focus on monitoring and controlling it. There were even more people trying to control and monitoring it than doing the real experiments in practice. 
after a couple of years. There was an overly focus on technology and not on behavioral change or institutional change. And still it was too much top down and too little bottom up. And after 10 years, the societal transition to more local, decentralized uh, energy initiatives took over the political construct. So society went with a higher speed than politics. That was nice to see. Uh, so what you see is you need to do everything to get it out of the hands of the regime um, because it tends to control it in a command and control way. But we learned a lot from it, so what we learned was taken in the next transition. It's an even more complicated one, the bio-based economy transition. So over the last couple of years, there was a long-term vision developed, uh, a whole network approach, a real uh, strategic and action-oriented plan with a facilitating role of the government. So we defined, again here, different pathways to different solutions, uh, which are quite uh, radical. And um, that's what we learned from the earlier energy approach. We took a more regional approach. So we took six regions, and basically the process was now led and driven by the regions themselves. So the regions became much more autonomous than in the original energy transition. And each region has an own transition agenda, an own way of financing it, and what you see is here the six different regions with six different foci. Very important to do that. And the role of the government was more, on the one hand, giving space to radical innovation, on the one hand, removing the barriers. And um, so they defined a new play with new players and new role that was very important. But what was even more important is that they were busy with removing barriers. And I have a kind of a shocking picture for you here, in order to make that step to a bio-based kind of economy, we found out that there are 69, 69 juridical barriers. We asked all kinds of companies, small, medium enterprises, multinationals, what are the barriers that you face in this transition? They came up with 200, we brought it back to 69 unique barriers. There are operational barriers, structural, fundamental, and conflicting barriers. So far, we have solved about one-third of it, two-thirds to go. If I give you some examples of these barriers, well, about 20 years ago, we adopted a waste law, and the waste law prohibits you to reuse waste elements, but that's absolutely vital in the bio-based and circular economy. There are other fundamental barriers. There's no le level playing field. There are taxes on the one hand on bioethanol, but none on NAFTA. How can you explain for that? There's no certification for bio-based based, uh, products. They're still not possible to use GMOs. Do you see the point? <laughs> This has nothing to do with a battle between technologies. These are barriers that we have identified ourselves, and uh, we need to remove them one by one. There are examples of the new economy working together with the old economy. This is a big petrochemical company, Sabic that has opened the doors of its laboratories for small, medium enterprises and startups to work together on bio products, like biopolymers, bioplastics, bio-building materials, even bio-natural <coughs> colors. So on that campus, entrepreneurs, dozens of entrepreneurs and SMEs work together in the highly protected laboratories on these new products. And the government has facilitated this process. They brought together the different parties that won't find each other easily. I'm working now together with the port of Rotterdam. That's extremely challenging because the port of Rotterdam is still the largest carbon knot in the world. It's the largest carbon distribution point in the world. 
and they now need to transform into a different kind of port. If you look at the concept of a port or a harbor, it's quite linear. You're importing goods and materials, you're exporting there, but what's the added value that you create? It's not that much. So we need to redefine the whole concept of a port, taking a circle of about 100 kilometers and see to what extent you can add economic and societal values. For instance, can you collect all kind of electronic waste, like the iPhones and iPads and whatever, and can you upcycle them? Because there are many, many useful materials in them. Well, we are working on that, and what we are doing is we are trying to stimulate new combinations. There's that new economy driven by, for instance, 3D printers, uh, app development. How can you relate that to a traditional port culture? Because they don't know these startups. Uh, what we simply do is we invite these startups and bring them together in the port building, and, and we're trying to formulate useful applications of, for instance, 3D printers. You can apply them in the maritime industry. In the whole container transport, within five years, that will be driven by app developments. Where are the app developers that are driving this process? The whole transformation into biorefinery. It takes about 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, to build up a biorefinery plant out of a series of experiments, 10 years. We have only 20 or 25 years more to go. So can you imagine what kind of challenge this is for the harbor as we know it? Um, yeah, so what we are doing now is we are creating a shadow line. Of course, the harbor of Rotterdam needs to pursue with a lot of these petrochemical and fossil fuel-based activities. There's no escape from that. That might last 10 or 20 years. But meanwhile, you need to build up a radical innovation shadow line. For instance, can you systematically experiment with 3D printer activities for the maritime industry? We are going to do that now. Can we focus more on waste management and resource production? We are going to do that right now. Um, so the lessons are, to summarize it, the first period of a transition might seem relatively easy. Thereafter, there are winners and losers, and there is more and more resistance, and then it really turns into a battlefield. And within the government, there's a natural tendency to fall back to the command and control steering mode rather than following the evolutionary governance mode. And space for frontrunners is absolutely crucial, and on top of that, we need more connectors people connecting the old economy with the new one. And, um, and, and on the one hand, it's challenging, but on the other hand, it's cumbersome because you need to pursue that for decades. So if I look at the success factors, on the one hand, it's about vision and ambition. It's about network approach. It's about strategy and action in one. It's about taking the regional approach as a kind of courageous mode and trying to facilitate in terms of uh, the government actors. And if I round off with a future agenda, what we learned from it over the past 20 years, we need many more big case studies in Europe, also outside Europe, but also in Europe, because we need to learn more from these big case studies. We also need more experience with upscaling and, let's say, the implementation process. We also need more attention for transitions within companies and organizations. And we found out that every system transition requires an organizational transition, and then the most difficult part is that requires a personal transition. So many of us need to overcome, let's say, our personal fears, because the stakes are high. Many of the people within the old regime, they have their basic fears. Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my status? Am, am I going to lose whatever? Yes, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> but every organizational transition requires a personal transition. So more and more we dive into social psychological processes to overcome the fear that many people have. And we need also a better theory on multiple actors, not only on front runners, but also on connectors and real game changers. 
what I said, topless. Well, to round off, I'm, I'm very glad that I could share with you some of the basic insights. We are a real scientific field in progress. You'll hear more about it by Frank Gills, one of our front runners in this uh, area. We think that we have enough knowledge that can be used within the challenging years that we will have ahead of us. Because when I started picking the word transition and system innovation 25 years ago, there was very little attention. There were only 10, 20 people in the room. Most of, most of them stared at me, what is the guy talking about? System innovation and transition, why is it needed anyhow? Well, we now have skipped the why part, we even skipped the what part, we are only focusing on how, but that's the most difficult part. Okay, thank you very much.